Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Jim. I'm an alcoholic. It's an honor and a privilege and a hell of an inconvenience to be here. (laughs) We flew all the way across the United States to be here, and uh, as we're coming across the middle part of the country, I was thinking to myself, why am I going across the United States to talk to people I don't know about something I don't do anymore? (laughs) And then then right after that, I thought, well, you've gone this far to get ice. (laughs) <laughs> I want to thank Jay Plumback and his committee for inviting us down here, and I want to thank uh, Jim, uh, James, our taping man. I want to thank Lou. They've all treated us extremely well. Did everybody else hear that noise? <laughs> I hear things sometimes. But... Um, We've been treated royally, and we, we understand now about Southern hospitality. I've never been in South Carolina before, and uh, I certainly want to come back. Um, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, the first time I got drunk, I was visiting my cousin in town. I lived on a terrible little farm north of Sioux City, Iowa. That's where I was born and raised. And uh, I was visiting my cousin in town around Christmas time, and I was 12 years old about. And we found the peanuts and the candy, and uh, we found a quart of slow gin. And I had a half a pound of Spanish peanuts, and I chug-a-lugged a bottle of slow gin and re my cousin's house. <laughs> and, you know, I wanted, I couldn't wait to do it again. And uh, 25 years later, I was uh, taking a little nap on my kitchen floor in Ojai, California, it was about 2.30 in the morning. I'd close the bar, as, us- as I usually did, and I was napping on my kitchen floor and uh, on my back in front of the open refrigerator door where I'd had a late dinner, uh, <laughs> co- a piece of cold chicken and a quart of Mogan David wine. And I was throwing up straight up in the air and uh, trying to avoid the, the, the product that was coming down, you know, it's hard to dodge, some, some of it is mist, actually, and uh, I was trying to dodge the wine mist as it was coming down. Those are the, that was my first and my last drunk. I had, I had drank after that, but that was my last drunk, and uh, I could really stop right here, and uh, I wouldn't have to go any further to qualify for membership in this program, because I never improved my taste in wine at all in 25 years of drinking. But I have to tell you a few other things. Um, I went to school like everybody else. Uh, I hated it from the first day to the last day. I was in school for 16 years. And I hated it all the time because I didn't do well. I had a a sort of a problem with paying attention. Uh, Today they would have said that I have attention deficit disorder, you know. And uh, they had other names for kids like me in those days. And it, it had something to do with being unruly and uncontrollable. But I uh, I managed to get through high school, graduated in 1952, 169th out of a class of 175. That's from the bottom. And uh, I wasn't there much in the last year, but the the dean of discipline told me, if if your, McNally, if your diploma is signed, it will be a miracle. And uh, it was signed. So I have a a legitimate high school diploma. But I went... uh, to working in a gas station right after that and uh, driving my old Ford up and down the back roads of Iowa and uh, had no ambition to do anything. I had no intent of doing anything. I certainly didn't want to go to college because I had developed a sort of an antagonism toward college boys, you know, that kind of attitude, kind of a, kind of a macho, uh, redneck attitude toward college, I would have to say. And uh, so I got polio in 1952, about a month after I got out of high school. And uh, I was hospitalized for 105 days and lost the use of my legs pretty much. And uh, I, I got out of that hospital a pretty angry, devastated young man. And uh, now I didn't have any clue about what the hell I was going to do. And uh, 
I was starting to drink a little beer now and then, and uh, as much as I could get, which wasn't very much in the beginning, but uh, I was starting to drink a little beer, and, and I was starting to feel a little better when I drank the beer. It was uh, took some of the sharp edges off of life. And uh, a guy came around to my house from the Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Department, and uh, he said, we'd like to uh, talk to you about going to college. And I laughed at him. I said, you know, I just barely made it out of high school. I don't know what I would be doing in a college. And he said, uh, and I said, um, besides, I'm, I'm not interested in your charity. Thank you very much. And he said, we're not talking about charity. We're talking about making you into a taxpayer. And uh, <laughs> I thought that was an odd way to present it. But uh, I said, okay, uh, why don't I try to be a taxpayer? So I agreed to go to this little college in eastern Iowa. And uh, I went down there and enrolled and studied political science, which was a devastating mistake in a lot of ways. But uh, I got interested in political science. And uh, after three years of being in the political science course, the head of the department said to me, uh, McNally, you have a kind of a weird linear way of thinking. Maybe uh, you ought to consider studying law. And uh, so I left college after three years and went over to uh, Omaha, Nebraska to study law and uh, at the uh, Creighton University over there. Good school run by the Jesuit priests, and it's a very tough school. And uh, for about six weeks, I straightened my act out. I didn't go to the bars. I, uh, I uh, didn't drink. I studied for the classes and recited, and I was actually a model student for about six weeks. And then the, the test results came out, and uh, I didn't do well. I didn't do well, and nobody did well. It never occurred to me that none of the students did well. They were just trying to break down our little, our little egos so that we could be taught something. And, um, but I took it personally because I'm an alcoholic. And uh, so I went back to the bars, and uh, in about eight months, I literally drank my way out of that school. Just absolutely. They didn't even want to talk to me anymore. So I bummed around for the summer and ended up enrolling in the University of South Dakota, which is nearer to my hometown, Sioux City, but uh, it's, it's not nearly as good a school as Creighton, but um, they would accept me, and that was the main thing. So I finished law school at the University of South Dakota in 1961. That'll tell you how old I am a little bit. And uh, I started practicing law in Sioux City. I got through the Iowa bar exam. It wasn't much of an examination. And, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, it was a joke, really, because they had an oral examination. And the, the statute said that you have to have an oral examination. So they'd sit the Iowa Supreme Court up on a stage, nine members, and they'd have the students uh, in the audience, and the justices would ask questions of the students. That was the oral exam. And my question was, uh, Mr. McNally, you're from Sioux City, right? Yes, I am, sir. Is Wiley Maine still practicing up there? Yes, he is, sir. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was how I <clears throat> that was how I passed the Iowa bar exam. Let me tell you, the California bar exam ain't like that at all. <laughs> but uh, I started practicing in an old real estate firm, and they had me examining abstracts of title to real property. And to make that simple, uh, you you get this big thick sheaf of papers that is the history of this farm or real estate or residence property. And you go through all these papers, starting with the original government patent, which is when we, st we stole it from the Indians. And you go all the way through to the current uh, entry, which might be a deed or it might be a mortgage or whatever. And you write an opinion uh, opining who you believe owns the property. That's what a title opinion is all about. And it's the dullest work in the world next to watching corn grow. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, it'll put you to sleep trying to go through all these papers. And I lasted there about six months. And uh, my friend Donald O'Brien, who had been appointed U.S. District Attorney, called me on the phone and said, how would you like to be a federal prosecutor? And I said, when do I start? And uh, he said, well, you have to go through a little investigation and so on. And so I went through the investigation, and I got appointed uh, in 1962 to be a federal prosecutor. And I was 29 years old. And... Uh, I thought I was a big shot. I had U.S. Justice Department credentials and gold leaf engraved, you know, and uh, a badge and all this kind of stuff. And I thought something was really going to happen. And what happened was that I, I just moved to better bars. You know, I, 
I was used to those beer bars where they have the sawdust on the floor and the brass rail in front of you. And when you fall off one of those hard stools and light on one of those brass rails, it'll hurt your ribs. But you go uptown where they have the upholstered step and upholstered seats. You fall off one of those about 2 o'clock in the morning and you, know, you don't even have any visible marks on you the next day. So that's the only thing that changed about my life. That's the only thing that really changed about my life. I was drinking in better bars. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certain by this time, looking back on it, by this time I was clearly an alcoholic because I needed a certain amount of alcohol every day. <clears throat> I had to have it. And it just seemed like a, a, an incredible coincidence that about 5 o'clock every day I'd end up in a bar somewhere, wherever I was. And uh, that went along for a while, and uh, John Kennedy was assassinated, and the government changed, and Lyndon Johnson took over the government, and uh, we didn't like Lyndon Johnson too well. And uh, so I left the U.S. Attorney's Office and decided to run for the state legislature. Now, if you drink a lot, you'll get ideas like that. <clears throat> <laughs> so I got on the ballot in 1964. I ran for the state senate. Iowa has a senate like I'm sure South Carolina has a senate. Not the federal, it's the state senate. And I started campaigning in the bars, as God intended us to do. <laughs> and uh, I got married in June of 64. This was now 64. And um, the campaigning was going well because you, you run into a lot of friendly people in the bars. Now, this was a very strong Republican district, and at that time, I was in the Democratic Party. And uh, I didn't have the slightest expectation of winning because, you know, it was like about 80% Republican and maybe 15% Democrat and 5% undecided, you know. And uh, But I went out and I did the best I could to campaign and, and met a lot of nice people and some that weren't so nice and, uh, and uh, didn't have any expectation, as I say, of winning the election. But... It was 1964, and uh, some of you are old enough to remember that that year uh, Barry Goldwater was running at the top of the Republican ticket, and Lyndon Johnson was running at the top of the Democratic ticket, and Johnson won by an overwhelming landslide, carrying himself and a lot of other incompetence into office, <laughs> including me, including me. I woke up the day after election, and looked at the paper, and sure as hell, I'd been elected to the Iowa Senate. <laughs> now, that was a big surprise to me, because uh, I had no real expectation of winning. Uh, it was a bigger surprise to one of our colleagues who was running for the House of Representatives at the state level, and he campaigned from one bar, and the place was called the Cornhusker Lounge, and he campaigned from this one bar stool. And when he was elected in the landslide, he was heard to remark, now that I'm a representative, shall I report to Des Moines or Washington, D.C.? He didn't know if he was a state or a federal legislator. <laughs> I'm not sure he ever found out, to be honest with you. That situation hasn't changed a damn bit back there, I'll tell you, for sure. But that's another pitch, and that's an outside issue, shall we say. Well, we moved to Des Moines, and my wife was pregnant. We moved to Des Moines, and... Uh, we set up, uh, I set up headquarters at the Savory Hotel Bar downtown, which is, which is where all the high-level government business was being done. That means in English that that's where all the drunks were gathering to get drunk. And uh, that's where I gathered to get drunk. And I drank every day and every night as much as I possibly could. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a glorious time because if you're, if you're an alcoholic like I am, the idea of unlimited amounts of free booze a lot of partying going on. It was just the ideal way to live. And, uh, uh, you know, it was perfect. I uh, I did go up to the hill once in a while and boat. You know, i got to admit that. But uh, I wasn't paying too close attention to the government's business. And uh, a guy came down to see me while I was there in the Senate, a guy from my hometown named uh, Dick S. Dick S. was a notorious drunk around Sioux City, and, uh, and he... Uh, had sobered up in Alcoholics Anonymous. That was well known as well. So he came to see me, and he had these 20 questions from John Hopkins Hospital. And he said to me, uh, if you see anybody down here you think might have a drinking problem, you might want to give them these 20 questions. And he handed me the papers, and I looked at the bottom first. You know, we may be drunk, but we're not stupid. And uh, 
The bottom says, if you can answer any three of these yes, you are definitely an alcoholic. And I wasn't ready to be a definitely an alcoholic yet. So uh, I said, well, I could, I could probably answer that first one, yes. Uh, drinking does occasionally make my home life unhappy. And that was the understatement of this century because uh, it was making my home life very unhappy. And uh, my wife delivered our first daughter in March of uh, 65, and, uh, and uh, I wasn't there much. I was gone a lot. And I'm not proud of that today, but I was never much around. And uh, life wasn't going too well. I did not run for a second term because I was afraid they were going to find out about me. I don't know what it was that I was afraid they were going to find out because I just had alcoholic paranoia. I wasn't selling my vote to anybody. I wasn't in anybody's pocket. My entire campaign had cost about a thousand bucks. And uh, we had raised most of that money with a hot dog and bean feed. So I wasn't in anybody's pocket, and uh, there wasn't anything to be afraid of, but um, I had that alcoholic paranoia, so I didn't run for a second term. I became a lobbyist instead, and uh, if you're an alcoholic, that's next to the best job in the world. It's really good. Partying is what you do for a living, and uh, on free booths, on other people's money. And that was my ideal of a, of a job. So I lobbied every day. I tried to get certain legislation passed and certain legislation headed off. And uh, I partied 24 hours a day, and it was glorious. It was absolutely fabulous. Now, I'd be doing that today, I suppose, except that my body was learning to reject alcohol, sometimes spectacularly from both ends. <laughs> and uh, I got to the point where... Um, I was sick all the time. I was blacking out. I was graying out. I had terrible metabolism problems. And I went to the local doctors and lied to them. Of course, said, it's none of their damn business how much you drink, right? They're trying to help you, but don't tell them the truth. And uh, so they sent me to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And uh, they asked me some real dumb questions up there, like, how much do you drink? And I'd say, well, I have an occasional social drink. And uh, that's a dumber answer. And uh, so they'd write down. They believe you. You know, you, they're taking a history, and they believe what you tell them. And they write down occasional social drink. After three days of intensive testing, they uh, were puzzled by the absence of data to support their conclusions. But they said, uh, we think we know what's wrong with you. And I said, what do you think it is? And they said, we think you have executive stress syndrome. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I liked the sound of it because there wasn't anything in there about booze or the abstinence from booze. And so uh, I said, what do you do about uh, executive stress syndrome? And the doctor said, well, we have these blue tablets, 10 milligram Valium. And uh, they said, whenever you feel stressed, you just take some of these little blue tablets. Well, I felt stressed all the time. <laughs> so I took them all the time and drank booze on top of them. You know, and, uh, you know, if you drink booze and you take Valium, you'll get very serene some days. Uh, I got so serene some days I couldn't hit my rear end with either hand. And, uh, and it was not going well. It was not going well at all. I, uh, I tried a lot of different things to find out what was really wrong with me. I had no idea. And, you know, it's really odd because I had no idea that I was an alcoholic. I knew I drank a lot. That was, that was, you know, to the most casual observer, that was obvious. But an alcoholic, I had a preconception that most people have, a, a stereotype of an alcoholic. And I had a picture in my mind of a 70-year-old guy in a First World War army coat with a bottle of Santa Fe toque in each side pocket in a brown paper bag. And he's trying to catch a train out of Des Moines in the train yards in the wintertime, no hat and cold, and uh, just a total down at the, down at the heels derelict. That was my conception of an alcoholic, and I had a three-piece suit. I got, you know, how could I be an alcoholic? I had a law degree, blah, 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 you know, the usual uh, denial stuff. And um, so I just kept drinking, and uh, it wasn't going well. It was not going well at all. Well, in uh, July of uh, 1968, my wife and by this time, three-year-old daughter are traveling on the freeway from uh, between Omaha, Nebraska, and Des Moines, Iowa, on Interstate 80 when a lady rear-ended us doing about 90 miles an hour. And uh, 
booted us off a high embankment and rolled us over seven times on a, down this high high embankment. And my wife was thrown out on the freeway and killed that day. And uh, my daughter and I were were uh, rolled up in the bottom of a dry creek bed and the station wagon was on fire. A uh, U.S. mail truck driver pulled us out of that burning station wagon and saved our lives. I had a broken shoulder and some broken ribs. My uh, daughter was not injured physically. And uh, after six days in the hospital, I got out and went back to uh, Des Moines. And uh, my life was over, I thought. I had no uh, no real reason to want to stay on the planet. And if you're an alcoholic like me, what you do when you get a terrible blow like that is you get drunk. And that was the only way I knew how to cope with any difficulty in my life. So I got drunk, and I stayed drunk for 30 days or 60 days. I don't know which. I, I wasn't counting the days. I had no intention of counting the days. And, uh, you know, you can't drink forever. You can't stay drunk forever, no matter how hard you try or what the substance is you're taking. Uh, your body will ultimately sober up, in quotes. I wouldn't call it sobriety, but I, I was ultimately pretty free of alcohol. And, um, and uh, I'm sitting on the edge of my bed, and thank God I wasn't drinking the morning of that accident. I, I don't know how I would have handled that. But um, I was sitting on the edge of my bed uh, wondering what the hell was going on with my life. I thought I had this higher power, you know, that hated human beings, was just figuring out ways to torture them, you know. And I had a really bad higher power. I had a kind of an Ayatollah Khomeini higher power, you know, that... Uh, <laughs> would drop you into a pool of everlasting fire for the, some very slight infractions, I'll tell you. And um, so I finally figured it out. You know, if you're, if you're a very sharp person, as I thought I was in those days, I analyzed it. I analyzed everything to death. And I figured out that all of the trouble that I'd had in my entire life had occurred in Iowa. <laughs> now, that's pretty good analysis, actually. It never occurred to me that all the good things that had happened to me had also happened in Iowa, because that's the only place I'd ever lived. lived. <laughs> so if your problem is being in Iowa, then the answer is obvious. Get out of Iowa. And so I persuaded my elderly mother to uh, move out to uh, California with us, um, my daughter and I, who was now three and a half, I think. And um, we moved up to Ojai, California in 1969. Ojai is a little tiny town inland from the coast, about 15 miles and the, uh, from Ventura on the coast, and it's about 80 miles north of Los Angeles. It's a lovely place, quiet place, kind of like an elephant graveyard, you know, where the old elephants go to die, you know. And so I just, I just bought a house out there and, and uh, started studying for the California bar exam and, uh, and started drinking in the Firebird Tavern, which was a local roadhouse up there, kind of a tacky little place with, you know, the millions of cigarette burns on the carpeting and the, those red velour drapes with the tatters, you know, they're kind of torn and the place smells like beer and urine. You know, it's a great place. My kind of bar, dark, you know, and jukebox in the corner and a few deadbeats hanging out at the bar, you know, and it's my kind of place. And I spent three years in that joint drinking their, their sauce. And uh, somehow, by a miraculous intervention, I got through the California bar and started practicing law in an old house down in Ventura, 15 miles from Ojai. And, uh, you know, the new kid on the block doesn't get the fancy cases, so I did a lot of criminal defense work. And I've tried hundreds of criminal cases, all kinds of criminal cases, a lot of them involving drunks in one way or another, because if you're a bar drinker, you run into a lot of people in the bars that have problems with the law. And... Uh, they don't have any money, but they have lots of problems with the law. You know? <laughs> so I was defending every deadbeat in town and uh, and uh, having some pretty good luck with it, actually. And uh, But you see, the problem was that I had to cross-examine police officers <clears throat> and CHP, that's the California Highway Patrol, and sheriffs and other law enforcement personnel and make them try to, try to make them look like the Keystone Cops, if I could, because... Uh, I wanted them discredited so that my clients would walk out the door free. You can't do that all day and, uh, and, uh, and make them happy. So you're going to meet them on the freeway some night with, uh, when you've got a 2 6 blood alcohol under your belt. And uh, that was my concern. And I knew that they would remember me if, uh, if they pulled me over. 
So I didn't want to go back to Ojai at night. I'd go from the bar after work and through the alley, and I'd sleep in my office. And I'd be dead drunk, and I'd sleep in my office. I had a big conference table, eight feet long. That was my desk, and it was an old house, so I had the dining room. My partner had, I think it was the, uh, a back kitchen, and we had the reception room in the living room, and I was in the dining room and with this old conference table, and I would sleep on the carpeting underneath the conference table. And, um, you know, he'd, my partner would come in in the morning, and he'd look down, hi, Jim, how you doing? And, <laughs> fine, just fine. And it was not going well. It was not going well at all. And, and uh, I was trying desperately to find out what the hell was wrong with me. I was reading inspirational books. I, I read all the pop psychology books. I read The Magic Power of Self-Image Psychology and Psycho-Cybernetics. Those were two popular books back there. And uh, nothing. It was like Chinese food. You know, an hour later, you're hungry again. And uh, there wasn't anything to it at all that had any depth or weight that I could grasp onto it. You know, it's really odd that I would not have thought for a minute that I was an alcoholic because the governor of Iowa, when I was in the legislature, was an alcoholic, sober alcoholic in AA, Governor Harold Hughes. He'd been sober 10 years when he got elected the first time. He was a very popular governor. He was elected two more times with overwhelming majorities. He ran for the United States Senate, was elected by a huge majority, and uh, introduced legislation requiring the military to treat alcoholism as a disease. Uh, as a result of that legislation, the Long Beach Naval Hospital was created, and a whole bunch of treatment centers were set up for alcoholics in the military. And uh, Betty F. Uh, got sober at the Long Beach Naval Hospital and created Betty F. Center down in Palm Springs, California. Some of you may have been through there. And um, I won't break. She can break her hand if she wants to, but I won't. But... Um, This guy was a fabulous character. He was a marvelous man, a totally honest guy. He was a very honest guy. And uh, I didn't, it never once occurred to me that I could have the same problem he had. So I just kept on drinking. That's what we do when we don't have any solution for our alcoholism. And uh, one day I crawled off from under that desk and picked up the Ventura paper. And there's a story in there about this uh, spiritual retreat house in Malibu that had burned down in a fire in 1970. And the story said they were going to be given these retreats. And uh, you could call a certain number, and they would set you up with a weekend retreat. And uh, I was desperate enough. I I would have done anything. I got to gone to China if that had been in the paper. And so I called this place, and um, the lady said, we're having a retreat uh, this weekend. And, uh, but, oh, uh, this weekend it's for alcoholics. And there was a long silence on my end of the phone. And I said, I'm not an alcoholic, but I'll come anyway. <laughs> you know, keep your options open. Never admit anything you don't have to admit. There are no deaf and dumb people in jail. You know, that's the motto. And um, so I went to this retreat in August of 1971. And uh, I was amazed. I knew alcoholics. I represented a lot of alcoholics, and these are people who are shooting at each other, cutting on each other, driving over each other with trucks, and, you know, driving drunk, uh, driving while getting over being drunk, the whole deal. And uh, the people that I saw at this meeting, these guys, it was a men's stag retreat, didn't look anything like the alcoholics that I knew. These guys, were their eyes were clear. They didn't have any wiring showing in their faces, you know, and uh, they were squared away. And uh, I thought, my God, they don't look like alcoholics to me. So uh, I, out of curiosity, I stayed. I, I wanted to bolt, but I stayed because I was pretty nervous. I hadn't had a drink all day Friday. And uh, so they invited me to come to their meeting on Saturday night, and I didn't want to go. I said, you know, I'm not an alcoholic, but you know, why would I want to go to an AA meeting on Saturday night? And they said, well, you know, you might learn something. Give it a whirl. So I went to the meeting on, on Saturday night, and these guys were talking about a big roundtable discussion meeting. They were talking about uh, blackout drinking, geographical cures for alcoholism, going from one state to the other to get away from yourself. They were talking about night terrors, and they got my attention with that. They talked about sitting up at 3 o'clock in the morning straight up in bed 
with the hair standing up in the back of your neck, absolutely terrified of something you could not identify. And I'd had that happen to me a lot of times. And uh, they talked about seeing little things that aren't there, you know, and hearing little noises that aren't really real. And uh, what they were doing, they were reading my mail. <clears throat> so when it came my turn at the table, I said, my name is Jim, I'm an alcoholic. Wow. Most important words I've ever spoken in my life. No question about it. Well, after the meeting, these two old timers cornered me. And I thought I thought they were crazy or something, you know. And they wanted to tell their stories. I didn't want to hear their damn stories. I wanted to tell them. <laughs> I wanted to tell them my story. <laughs> my long tale of woe. And so they told me their stories in spite of my better judgment. And uh one of them said to me, uh, I think you're going to drink some more, but we have screwed it up so you won't enjoy it anymore. <laughs> the other guy wasn't nearly as straightforward. He said, look, if you think you may have a problem with alcohol, go back to Ventura, find somebody in AA, and go to some meetings and see if there's something that you can use there, see if something that will help you there. So they were both right. I went back to Ventura, got drunk, stayed drunk for a couple of weeks, Got real sick from drinking alcohol, and finally I got desperate enough to call a guy named Bud G., who was a counselor in the courts. Bud was an old-time AA member and a crusty kind of a guy, and he'd been sober 20 years or so at the time. And I called him, and I said, Bud, I think I might have the beginning of a little tiny drinking problem. <laughs> he said, we know. <laughs> Everybody knew. I mean, we're the last to find out, usually. You know, we're the last to find out. So we had lunch, and uh, he said, you know, if you want to be sober, I suggest you go to the AA meetings, and you can start today. I thought, today? God, that seems a little soon, don't you think? You know, <laughs> uh, Maybe Thursday. He said, no, if you want to be sober, I suggest you start today. And you could go over here to Oxnard, California, to the Norman and Cooper Manor. Never heard of the place. It was a low bottom drying out place, the lowest of the low. People went there to die of alcoholism, and uh, I didn't know that. So I get in my, my BS three-piece lawyer suit and my dinged-up alcoholic Cadillac, and I go over to this, this meeting, this, this Norman and Cooper man, and I go in there, and it's, it's worse than my worst expectation of what an AA meeting would be like. You know, there's 12 or 13 old guys, old guys, as old as I am now, sitting around a scarred table with a bare fly speck bulb hanging down, you know, and they got their blue terry cloth robes and their rubber shoes with the, you know, the go between your big and your next toe. And uh, the head leper is reading from this big blue book. <laughs> and he's saying, if you want what we have... <laughs> I thought to myself, and I was i was not at all honest, I thought to myself, if I don't get out of here in a minute, I may get what he has. <laughs> so I left, and I went back to Bud, and I said, what in the hell, why did you send me to this drying out place, Bud? This is the, these people are genetic misfits. They, they're rowing with one oar in the water, you know. And Bud said something that was not intended to be Cute or kind, he said. Well, they have big, sh they have meetings for big shots in Beverly Hills. That's all he said. I thought, well, that's about right. You know? <laughs> so I got in my car that Friday night. He told me how to get there, and I drove about 85 miles to Beverly Hills to go to an AA meeting. And I passed at least 50 perfectly good AA meetings. I didn't know that at the time. I could have gone to any one of the meetings around that area, but I didn't want to be seen cleaning up my act in that county. So I went to Beverly Hills, and uh, this was the Rodeo Drive Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Swear to God. It's on, it used to be on Rodeo Drive. I spoke there six months ago, and it's now no longer on Rodeo, Rodeo Drive. They still call it the Rodeo Drive Group, but it's on Wilshire Boulevard. Figure that one out, you know. I used to drink in a bar that was called the 20th Street Tavern that was on 19th Street. I don't know. 
why that was. <laughs> Maybe it's a disease of perception, as Brooks says. <laughs> Probably is. But um, I went to the Rodeo Drive group, and uh, and uh, on a certain Friday night on September 10 of 1971, uh, there was a gorgeous woman uh, speaking, giving a 10-minute talk, and uh, I'm sitting there. I have been I've been sober maybe five days by then, and uh, during my one of my many many five day sobrieties, and uh, I decided that she had what I wanted and would go to any length to get. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I invited her out to coffee after the meeting. And uh, she, her 10-year-old daughter was there. It was her natal birthday. And she went to coffee. Now, she has a slightly different version of this story. Now, if you want to hear that, you'll have to have her speak here. Because this, I have the floor, and I get to say <laughs> <laughs> my side of the story. She went to coffee, and we, we got along very well. And we started dating. And uh, 87 days later, we got married. I was laughing when I heard June talk about 90 days, meeting her husband in 90 days. I thought, God, we got you beat, June. 87 days. Well, in December 3rd of this year, uh, we'll be married 34 years. Mary here. I'll tell you, she's still gorgeous, and I'm still nuts about her. That's the truth. She had two children. She had a little boy, Doug, and a little girl, Ellen, and I had this little girl, Mary Margaret. We put those kids together, and they didn't fit so good. The kids fit pretty good, but the parents were having a few little problems. And uh, so we uh, we struggled. We went to a lot of AA meetings, and if it were not for the AA meetings, we, we couldn't have stayed together because we for one and a half hours, we were at peace. And uh, we didn't get into any little disputes about whose kids were doing what or why or all the BS that you do in a what they call a blended family, but and it was not it was not going well because I wasn't sober yet for one thing. I didn't get sober for a while more. I kept drinking and going to AA meetings, drinking, going to AA. I went to a jillion AA meetings. I heard a lot of good speakers. I heard Chuck Chamberlain. I heard Clancy Immisland. I heard you know some really fine AA speakers, and I went to a lot of discussion meetings, and I learned a lot about AA. But I couldn't stop drinking. And I finally came to the conclusion that I was going to die drunk. I knew for sure this would work for you, but I was kind of a different type. I, I'm, I have a little problem with terminal uniqueness. And uh, I knew that this thing would not work for me. It might work for you because I'm way too smart for this stuff. You know, all these simple-minded steps and this outdated 1939 book, for God's sake. What an order. I can't go through with it. Who, you know, whoever, who talks like that? Nobody talks like that. And, uh, you know, if I was one point smarter, I'd have died drunk, I think. I've seen a lot of really dumb people make this, this program, but very few really smart people. And it's just how it goes. I don't know why, but I'm sponsoring a guy right now who is, he's, he's got the paralysis of analysis. If you say, you know, go downtown today and, and buy a new pair of pants, you'll say pants. Does that mean this or does that mean that? He makes distinctions. He argues about everything, and he's an intellectual. And there's a lot of dead intellectuals out there that can't get this program. I don't know why that is. But um, we were not doing too well because I was still drinking. And uh, I did everything I could possibly think of to, to stop drinking on my own. And I finally, as I say, I came to the conclusion I was going to die drunk because I, I knew that I was hopeless, absolutely hopeless. Because AA didn't even work for me, you know. I hadn't done the steps, of course, but don't don't mention that. When I finally realized that I was never going to be sober, that was my first step. That was my admission of absolute powerlessness over alcohol. And so I'm in a bar one night. I'm in the Firebird bar. And uh, I had a bottle of Coors about 7 o'clock at night. Mary was in L.A. Kids were gone somewhere. And I had a bottle of Coors. I had the whole evening ahead of me. I had plenty of money in my pocket. I ordered that bottle of Coors, drank it, ordered a second one, poured the first half of the second bottle in a glass and drank it. And for a, an intellectual reason that I cannot give you today, I pushed the second half of that bottle back in the bar and walked out of the place. And uh, that's the last drink of alcohol I've had to this day. That was March 30th, 1972, 33 years ago. 
but I can still see the sweat running down the side of that bottle. And, uh, you know, I, have a, I don't have a cure at all. I have a daily reprieve uh, contingent upon the maintenance of a spiritual condition. But it didn't start out that way. When I got sober, uh, my life got worse. I was real sick, real sick, because I had fallen in among these purists who said, we don't take pills either. We don't take Valium. I go, oh, my God. You mean you go on the natch? You don't take anything? No, we don't take anything. So I threw away the pills. And when I threw away the pills, I got real nervous. I got anxious. And I had anxiety attacks really bad to the point where I'd be hyperventilating, couldn't get a breath of air, and I'd end up in the emergency room. And that happened periodically for two and a half years after I had my last drink. So I was badly, badly damaged by consuming alcohol for over 25 years. And I don't want to go through that again. You know, as Eisenhower said about smoking, I may start again, but I will never stop again. And I feel that way about uh, booze. So I don't, I, it's going to be a lot easier to stay sober than it is to get sober, as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, you know, we had a lot of help. We had huge amounts of help. After uh, Bud, uh, he kind of drifted out of my life. And I got a sponsor, um, a guy named David H., who was a 220-pound prize fighter. He fought Ezra Charles in the ring. He was a tough guy. And um, he appointed himself my sponsor. He said, I'm going to be your sponsor. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. So he took me through the steps. But he, he, had, he was my sponsor for several months before I got sober. And... Uh, when I'd come back to the meetings, badly hungover, sick to death, he'd say, how's your way working? <laughs> and I'd say, fine, just fine. And he'd say, notify your face. <laughs> he was relentless, really relentless. But he forced me to go through the steps. And uh, if I hadn't gone through the steps, I wouldn't be here today. That's absolutely no question in my mind that I would not be in this room today if I had not gone through those steps. I had to take every single one of those 12 steps and uh, in depth because, uh, you know, I've got a real bad case of alcoholism. And uh, David, by gosh, uh, didn't stay sober. He, he got 26 years and had to go back out. As June said, alcohol called to him and he had to go back. And uh, he's wet-brained in a veterans hospital in uh, Las Vegas uh, now. This day. But I think of him all the time because he saved my life. He helped a lot of people, and God bless him. We don't always keep it. You know, uh, Ebby Thatcher was Bill Wilson's Eskimo, carried the message to Bill Wilson, and he got drunk a lot before he died. I think he had two years sobriety when he died. But, uh, you know, that's just how it goes with some people. Anyway, um, I got sober, and I'm sick as a dog, and, you know, life is really bad. You know, it seems to me that, the problem with alcoholics is not drinking so much. It's sobriety, you know. Uh, I'm okay when I'm stone drunk. You know, nothing bothers me. But when I'm sober, you know, my hair hurts. <laughs> and uh, I, I, get, I get jittery and I get irritable and I get pissed off and everything, you know. And that's why I drank, because I couldn't stand my, being my own skin when I was sober. And... Uh, AA has provided me with a way to live on this planet comfortably in my own skin so that I don't have to drink. It's, that's the whole pitch as far as I'm concerned. Being able to live comfortably in my own skin so that I don't have to drink. Well, a lot of funny things happen. I'm not going to take your whole evening with the stuff that happened. What time is it? Nine o'clock almost. Um, I have a... After ten years of sobriety, I was looking around the courtroom one day. I spent all my life practicing criminal law and plaintiff's personal injury law and other trial work. And I was a little tired of trying to prove something to somebody that they didn't want to hear. So I looked around the courtroom, and the only guy in the courtroom that seemed to be not working too hard was the judge. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that was a good job. I ought to get that job. So I made application to the governor's office to be appointed to the Superior Court up there in Ventura County, California, and, uh, and they sent me a 33-page questionnaire, which I had to fill out, and there's one of the questions said, 
is there anything about your life that you think the governor ought to know in deciding whether to appoint you to the court? I couldn't evade that question. That's a pretty pretty broad question. And so I said, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous for 10 years, and uh, I don't disclose that at the public level, and I hope the governor won't either. That was a flippant answer. I'm, I'm aware of that. But I had no expectation, really, of getting appointed. So I gave it a flippant answer. Well, they sent a they sent a three or four four person commission down. That's it's a it's a group of lawyers that they appoint to examine the prospect, the uh, applicant to see if they're qualified to do the work. So these people came down. We had a good conference, a couple of hours, and at the end of it, one of the female commissioners said, uh, "On this question 33, you say you're a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous." How can we be sure you won't show up drunk some morning if you're appointed to the court? I had to be honest about it. I said, I can't promise you that I won't. Because when I was promising people that I wouldn't show up drunk, I was showing up drunk. I won't promise you that I won't show up drunk some morning. But if I keep doing what I've been doing, as faithfully as I've been doing it, there's a reasonable chance that I will not show up drunk some Monday morning. And I thought, well... This rigorous honesty bullshit blew that job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't. So I was appointed in 1982, December, uh, to the Superior Court in Ventura County, and I served there 12 years, retired in 1995. And the job called upon every single principle that AA teaches to just survive. And uh, my anonymity lasted about a week and a half. <laughs> I was in, I was assigned to juvenile delinquency court, the first assignment that I had. And a kid that I had seen around the meetings a lot, 16-year-old kid, was doing real well. And I couldn't see any reason to keep him on probation any longer. So I took him off probation. And he came up and he said, can I come up and shake your hand? Comes up to the bench, shook my hand, and turns to a courtroom full of people and says, Thanks, Judge. I'll see you at the AA meeting tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, so much for anonymity. Yeah. Well, that changed my life because, you know, if you're a judge, the prosecutors want everybody sent to prison forever. The public defenders want everybody cut loose. You know, there are various degrees of sentiment on either side of that deal. And um, But being a sober alcoholic judge puts you in a place where you're accused of being soft on alcoholics. And there's some truth in that. that that's actually true in my case because uh, people come into the courtroom, they got a serious drinking problem, and it looks to me like if you can straighten out the drinking problem, they won't have any other problems of the law. So I'd send them to AA, and the prosecutors wanted them sent to jail or prison. And uh, so I'd say, now let's get them sober first, then we'll see, see what to do about it. Send them to AA under the penalty of contempt and hang a lot of time over their head and make them go to the meetings, make them report to the probation officer. And, uh, you know, I sent hundreds and hundreds of people to AA, and NA and CA and GA. And one day I sent a woman to al -Anon. I did. I did. She was buying a gallon of wine a day for this poor guy, and he was dying of alcoholism, and she couldn't see anything wrong with it. You know, he was just buying him a gallon of wine every day, and he was drinking it. So I said, you got to stop doing that. <laughs> so I sent her to Alana. But uh, it was it was not all terrible. I, I spent six years in uh, dependency court dealing with abused children. And that's a hard place to work. The first year was the hardest year of my life. Uh, dealing with uh, serious child abuse. And our job in that court was not to punish people. That's up to the criminal court. But our job was to fix these families any way we could. And... Uh, Got it. It was obvious from the first day that 90% of these people are addicts or alcoholics or both. So I started using AA and uh, sending people under contempt power. You know, if you don't go to the AA meeting, you get a uh, you get a weekend in jail for every AA meeting you miss. That's a hard line, but you know, a beach dying of alcoholism. And uh, some people resisted a lot, and they ended up doing a lot of weekends in jail before they figured out it was a hell of a lot easier to go to an hour and a half meeting than it was to serve a weekend in jail. So they'd go. And I run into people all over hell that I uh, have sent to AA. And some of them stayed, actually. Some of them actually stuck it out. But uh, a lot of them didn't as well. So, uh, you know, uh, I had a I had a deal. I was 
leading a meeting up in Ojai one time, and, and uh, the leader gets to sign the court card in that particular group. And the guy comes up after the meeting to get his court card signed, and his neck is red all the way to the top of his head. He is pissed. He doesn't want to be at this meeting. And he, I said to him, I thought I'd lighten him up a little bit. I said, did you get a little nudge from the judge? And he said, yeah, you son of a bitch, you're the one that sent me here. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'll recognize the signature on this card when you bring it in on Monday. <laughs> they weren't always authentic. I, I'll, I'll have to add that one quick thing. Uh, one guy, I had I had him on felony probation on the condition that he go to three AA meetings a week and provide written proof of attendance to the probation officer. And he came in in a few months with 200 signatures on a card. They were all in the same handwriting, in the same pen. And they were supposed to represent many different meetings, you know. So I knew he was jiving, you know. So I said to him, you go to those AA meetings, 200 of them? Yeah, I did, sir. Yes, I did. They ever read the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous in any of those meetings? Yes, sir, every meeting. Every meeting. And you heard him read those 12 Steps every time. Yes, sir, I did. If you can recite any one of the 12 Steps, I'll take you off probation. Poor guy couldn't do it. <laughs> he said, there's something about God in there somewhere. <laughs> I said, close but no cigar. You know? <laughs> well... I retired in 1995, and uh, I'm running out of time here. And uh, we moved to Santa Barbara from Ojai, California. And, um, you know, we're both uh, very much involved in AA. We talk quite a bit around, and, and we sponsor quite a few people, and we have a really a good time in AA. It's, it's been a fun trip for us. But I have to close this up by saying the most important things that I could say is that I've taken all 12 of these steps, the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 steps, and I've had a spiritual awakening as the result of taking those 12 steps. I hasten to add that the spiritual awakening that I have had is not of the what I unkindly call the Bill Wilson hot flash type, where you have this sudden illuminating experience and your life changes totally. The kind of spiritual awakening that I've had has been of the slow educational variety that it's referred to in Appendix 2 of the Big Book. And slow, painful educational variety, I think I might add, and uh, it hasn't always been straightforward. You know, sometimes you take two steps forward and one back. Sometimes you take two steps forward and three back. But your progress is generally forward. And um, I don't, it couldn't have happened any other way for me. I'm glad I didn't have an easy first five years. It wasn't easy for me at all. But uh, I'm very pleased that I had that experience. Then I had this higher power I told you about. This Ayatollah Khomeini higher power, an angry old white guy in the sky, I used to call him, who would drop you into a pool of everlasting fire for some really small infractions, you know, just little tiny crap. And I couldn't deal with that. I, I, I hung on to that higher power, believe this or not, for 18 and a half years. And it was murder. It was absolute murder. I got nothing but silence. And uh, finally one day I had to let go of it, totally. I let go of it altogether, and it re I realized then that I was just holding on to an old idea of God. And the book says some of us tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result were nil until we let go absolutely. So I had to let go of that old higher power, and I have a new higher power now, totally different higher power. Uh, I refer to it simply as the healing power of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's my higher power, and that's good enough for today. It may not be good enough for next week, but it's good enough for today. And it keeps me sober a day at a time. And so to wind this up, I'd like to invite the blessing of that higher power on all of us tonight. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.